absolutely, yeah. Please write all over these. so far is up here and it says we know already that American literature is reflective of American culture we've also studied Gatsby as an American novel with American themes and have tried to see Gatsby as a model American today with these ideas in mind we're going to attempt to answer this question what is the meaning of the last few pages of the book particularly with regard to the rest of the novel Another way of putting this is what is Fitzgerald's rhetorical purpose? If we're going to think about this as AP language students, but this, I think this is like the basic gist of it. Um, so that's where we're heading today, the essential question of the day. So to begin, I present you with these quotations. Gatsby turned out all right at the end. It is what preyed on Gatsby, what foul dust floated in the wake of his dreams. Number two, after his embarrassment and his unreasoning joy, he was consumed with wonder at her presence. He had been full of the idea so long, dreamed it right through to the end, waited with his teeth set, so to speak, at an inconceivable pitch of intensity. Three, but with every word she was drawing further and further into herself, so he gave that up and only the dead dream fought on as the afternoon slipped away. Four. But there was Jordan beside me, who, unlike Daisy, was too wise ever to carry well-forgotten dreams from age to age. Five, the lawn and drive had been crowded with the faces of those who guessed at his corruption, and he had stood on those steps concealing his incorruptible dream as he waved them goodbye. So those are some quotations for you to consider. So the first question just asks you, what do these quotations suggest is important about the novel? And how can you tie in American dreams to this, or sorry, American themes to this idea? That's all. So look at these quotes. This is going to help you today. Just think about these quotes and then how you can tie in American themes to whatever idea you perceive.
problem and solve similar things, so that's all. I just wanted to prime you, in a way, for what you'll be discussing, but just to sort of prove to you, like, look, these quotes are here, we are AP students, we do notice repetition, that's all. So there you go. So these are the real business of today, these ones right here, these are like the juiciest, I think. So I would like to focus more on these ones. So this, the first one, number six, comes from um, the final, or not the final, wow, chapter eight, and it reads, Gatsby must have felt that he had lost the old warm world, paid a high price for living too long with a single dream, a new world, material without being real, where poor ghosts breathing dreams like air drifted fortuitously about, like that ashen, fantastic figure gliding toward him through the amorphous trees. And then the final page of the novel reads, the house's vanished trees, the trees that had made way for Gatsby's house, had once pandered in whispers to the last and greatest of all human dreams. For a transitory enchanted moment, man must have held his breath in the presence of this continent, compelled into an aesthetic contemplation he neither understood nor desired, face to face for the last time in history with something commensurate to his capacity for wonder. And as I sat there brooding on the old unknown world, I thought of Gatsby's wonder when he first picked out the green light at the end of Daisy's dock. He had come a long way to this blue lawn, and his dream must have seemed so close that he could hardly fail to grasp it. He did not know that it was already behind him, somewhere back in that vast obscurity beyond the city, where the dark fields of the Republic rolled on under the night. Gatsby believed in the green light, the orgastic future that year by year recedes before us. It eluded us then, but that's no matter. Tomorrow, we will run faster, stretch out our arms farther, in one fine morning. So we beat on, boats against the current, borne back ceaselessly into the past. I mean, <laughs> right? It's like typical Fitzgerald. Like, this is what we've seen from him. Um, these quotes are so rich, so many interpretations we can kind of come up with. So I know that you know how to annotate these. You've done this a lot of times before. You're used to Fitzgerald's writing. Um, so that's essentially it. You now have the chance to write for a large chunk of time. I want to say um, at least five, at least five minutes maybe more. Um, but there you go. So annotate that the way that you're used to. On the back, too, you have tons of room. So this is where you can prepare your questions for your peers for when you're doing the seminar and or observations that you want to make sure that you bring up in the seminar. So there you go. Tons of space there. Essential questions for your discussion. I just repeated the one I already gave you in bold. But I also gave you the, these two to think about. Why did some characters continue to live while others didn't? Why did Gatsby have to die? And then finally, the answer to this question we've been wondering about this whole time. What is the foul dust that floated in the wake of Gatsby's dreams? So lots of stuff, definitely things to, that we're probably not going to answer. But I just want to see what you can do. All right? And then, question stems if you need them, or sentence stems, so there you go, take tons of time, take like five to ten minutes, let's say.
about five more minutes. Finish your sentence. All right, I think we're ready. Oh my gosh. 
gosh, I'm so excited to hear what you say. This is the last page, like, what? And it might be the weirdest, honestly, it really might. So I'm super excited to hear what you guys have to say about this. Looking around at your pages, it looks awesome so far. So um, as you know, I'm not supposed to say anything. So I'm just gonna sit here, you guys talk to each other. I'll jump in if need be, but that's it. Anything else you need before I just let you go? Okay, yeah, take off, you got it. Well, you got something? What you can see here is that it says, it eluded us then, but that's no matter. Tomorrow we will run faster, stretch out our arms further. Now what this means is that to, for a dream to be American, one must pursue it. Even if every time they fail, they have to keep going and keep trying doubly as hard. And I think that's what uh, Gatsby's greatest characteristic in this uh, entire book really is how he goes at his dream, how his ambition is full and in his heart, and he never ceases to pursue it. Are you done? Yeah. <laughs> the girl awful woman was saying, uh, I, I interpreted the last pages as like, the promise of like the dream, it's like, it's like an allusion to the American dream, and it's the, it's the only thing like keeping people, like sane I guess, keeping people on task and focused, even though in reality, the chance of them achieving the dream is very slim, but the fact that the dream still exists makes them strive and do well, and attempt to do well. Yeah, I agree with Vance. I think what jumped out at me about this kind of passage is that uh, at the end it says, oh, it's against the current born back ceaselessly into the past. So it's kind of just like the idea that, um, yes, this is the American dream, and you know you should never give up and keep going, but it's very cynical. It, it views it like, um, you know, for every step forward, you take maybe you, you take two steps back. So. Uh, I think kind of Fitzgerald is making a point about how if you have a dream, it's achievable, and you know everybody strives for it. But there's a lot of like moral depravity involved, and a lot of you know, steps backwards. Yeah, I, I was just kind of uh, wondering, reading this, kind of contrasted with the tragedy of Gatsby's story, like whether Fitzgerald kind of views this as uh, as a critique of the American dream, or like if he's condemning that, or whether he's in support of it, and it kind of drifts, or I've kind of always seen it, like it drifts in between being being in support of it and um, kind of condemning it more. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that, how um, in a way he's kind of condemning it by saying that like, yes, this idea of the dream exists, and there's the dream, but then beyond the dream, there's not really much there. So he's talking about how he was to like the Dutch sailors, like first discovering like where they are, which is New York, with the whole thing about like the, it's vanished trees. So he's talking about how when they first like came and saw America for the first time, it was, this am it was like this amazing thing. They'd never seen something like this before. And like they would never again see something like this because it's, it's, a, it's the last time in history um, or they would come face to face for the last time in history with something um, commensurate to his capacity for wonder. So it's kind of like, um, like named that to Gatsby seeing the green light. It's like when he sees that for the first time, um, it's kind of like, it's so amazing that he's never seen something so wonderful because he's never like, been able to get this close to Daisy. But then once he sees the green light, it's kind of like, he's kind of gotten to this point of his dream and like it's hard to go past that. So I thought that, um, it, it was in between, but I thought um, Fitzgerald, Fitzgerald more favored the uh, like criticism side of the American dream, that it was unattainable and unrealistic, and also that there was too much emphasis put on it, because one of the questions up here was, um, why did some characters continue to live while others didn't? Why did Gatsby have to die? And I said that he had to die because his dream died, and it's such a huge part of his life, and probably most other Americans that are striving for that dream that there's nothing to really hold on to after it's gone. I agree with that, and I think that um, 
on page two when they talk about the foul dust, I think that the foul dust is his hope and his idealism, and it's like it's what preyed on him. He had these like this all-consuming hope, and he was overwhelmed by it. Um, and on page two, it also says that he had like a gift for hope and a romantic readiness. And then on page one sixty one, when they're talking about um, like right before he died, he talks about what a grotesque thing a rose is, and I think it's kind of alluding to this idea that he's kind of given up on his dream of love, and he's found that like his love for Daisy is almost like unattainable, and so he has to die in a way because um, he can't attain what he's always strived for. And also, I think that kind of applies to all the characters that died too, because I think Myrtle, George, and Gatsby all had dreams that they couldn't really um, attain because um, Gatsby wanted Daisy, of course, and then George and just wanted Myrtle to himself because I think he kind of knew that she was having an affair and he, I think George and Myrtle also wanted wealth because they were living in like the poor area and um, Myrtle wanted Tom more than George and wealth. So I think that's why those characters um, died and the others lived because the other characters were content with their lives. Like even Daisy, she like Tom was abusive to her and not a good husband, but she was like okay with it. She was kind of like just complicit with it and like willing to stay in that life. It also there's a quote from Tom about um, Gatsby after he dies, um, going back to what Celeste said about the dust that said that fellow had it coming to him. He threw dust in your eyes just like he uh, threw it in Daisy's eyes. And I think, going like, back to what Celeste said, that it was his hope and, like, ideas and stuff, that, like, it's his talk of grandeur and his illusion of, like, all of his wealth and stuff that was, like, what was holding him back and was also able to, like, I guess, affect others like it did to Nick and Daisy. Mm -hmm. Kind of adding on to that, going back to, like, the reason why he had to die, uh, I kind of think... Uh, the characters that died, Fitzgerald um, chose them to die because they kind of represented the corruption of like a greater um, American dream. Like Gatsby was the epitome of um, connoting uh, wealth with success, and Myrtle like just wanted fancy things and um, and like expensive dresses. So I think I think. Um, more than anything, Fitzgerald is critiquing how, um, especially during this period, but throughout American history, we've tied together wealth and success in a way that isn't always healthy. And I also think it um, kind of fits with the time. I think in A Push, we've been talking about like idealism of this era, and um, that's sort of like tied in here is that his Hamartia is his idealism, and so. He, um, he, that's his like fatal flaw, and that's what causes his death, is that he's so like, in love with this idea of Daisy that um, when he loses it, he dies. And so I think that it like, is definitely like, fitting with the time period, and that kind of ties in with the idea of this being like, an American novel, and that it like, fits with the history of the time period. Any more? That was awesome. This is about the time where we would need to switch, so any last thoughts from this group? Awesome job. Thank you for a group. Yes. Yes. And then, yeah, same here. I like that. I'm
but why do some characters continue to live and why not, and why some die? I like what the group said about them, I forgot who said, representing like the American dream, like Myrtle and George are just about to move out west and Gatsby has like a typical American rags to riches story. And I think the reason they died was to represent the death of the American dream. But I also think that in the last few pages, Fitzgerald purposely like wrote it out like that. Like at the end where he says that they keep running, they run faster, they keep paddling their boats and whatnot. I think he said that as a way to show that the American dream is being revived. It's a renewal, a re like a revision of the American dream in a new way. Like Gatsby and Myrtle and George had to die so that the old American dream could come back in a greater way for them, in a, in a way for them to achieve it. Yeah, I, I um, agree with some of the things you said, Grace, and I wanted to take it back to what you were speaking about earlier in class about the deconstruction of the American dream and how Gatsby might like represent that. And I think part of the American dream is kind of living to an old age with like all of your riches. Um, and Gatsby doesn't get to do that because of the other things that happen in the novel. So I think that there's just like another component that I noticed in this last chapter um, that really shows that he's not really truly representative of the American dream. I disagree with the American dream dying and being Fitzgerald's central take. I think that it talks more about, well, the American dream might not necessarily, like dreams are by their very nature unachievable. I think that Gatsby does drive that point home when he talks about, for instance, the green light fading away from no longer uh, being this enchanted object. They're at the same time required, and I think that that's really highlighted in the last paragraph uh, where they talk about tomorrow we will run faster, stretch out our arms further. I think that Fitzgerald is more arguing about the American dream, that it's it's something that, while it may not be required, or may, while it may not be achievable for everyone, it's still required for our nation to progress, for everyone to have this, this concept of dream. And um, yeah, I just think that moves further into like Gatsby isn't like one man. I think that he's more representative of like a national consciousness of dreaming. Where I think that everyone in America, and this is just Fitzgerald's point, I think, um, has this idea that we should strive out and we should dream. Um, yeah, I think that like when he talks about so we beat on boats against the current, he's clearly not talking about one individual, he's speaking about the entire American um, consciousness. What do you guys think the uh, foul dust that floated in the wake of Gatsby's dream represents? Well, I really didn't know, but I like what the other group said about it being hope in my dream. I forgot who said that. But like, Celeste, okay, good job, Celeste. <laughs> but I really like the thought of it being, it, it being hope and positivity and that's why Tom had was such an awful person. He was like, he threw dust in your in your eyes. He threw hope in your eyes. He had that hope. I interpreted it a little bit differently um, because Gatsby talks so much about the past, and um, when he like says, "Oh, of course we can repeat the past," I thought the foul dust might be the future or like the present, um, in that how it's changing it because it's, his dream isn't playing out like he wanted it to, and it isn't mimicking the past, and. Um, Part of the American dream is also like the future rather than like the, most people try to create a better future for themselves and they don't want to relive their past because their pasts are often tarnished with like bad things that they're trying to get away from. Um, I, my interpretation of the foul dust was that um, those were kind of the things that he had to do in order to be able to achieve his ultimate dream. And like obviously I feel like when he when he like started off on his journey to become like a model American, he wasn't planning on basically being a bootlegger and making all his money that way, but that's simply what he felt that he had to do in order to achieve his ultimate goal of wealth, to be able to attain Daisy. Yeah, I kind of thought in the same direction. I said that the dust was just reality and the reality of the situation, um, and that his dream by that point was no longer about wealth, it was about Daisy, and the reality of the situation was she was unattainable. Um, and with that, especially after the car crash, because then someone from that point on was destined to die, um, just because of Wilson. So the reality of the situation was kind of corrupting his dream, it was blinding uh, his dream from him and keeping it from happening. What were your interpretations of the last line? So we beat on both specific and like the 
Setbacks, despite Gatsby not really achieving the dream that he hoped that he would, that there is still hope. I think Skyler said that the American people will still keep moving on. Uh, yeah. um, I agree with Grayson and also where it says votes against the current. I think I think Skyler was talking about how it's talking about the entire American people, not just Gatsby or one person. Um, so when it says votes against the current, like that's like the entire ocean, like that's one force that's pushing against all the boats. So it's kind of like American society, like the issues that everyone faces that hold them back from their dreams that like cause the American dream to be so like ambitious because you have to keep pushing, you have to keep beating on against the current that like is our society. Can I ask a question? Like, why do you think it says come back ceaselessly into the past? Like why the past? I mean, I agree, I agree, I should say, with what you just said about how, and, and what Scholar was saying about the pronouns kind of changing from Gatsby to then us and our and we. Um, so I do agree that it's talking about Americans kind of like rising, I guess, like up against the struggles. But yeah, I just wonder what the last three words are. Like, what do they mean into the past? Like, are there only struggles in the past, but yet you guys were saying that this is about the future, so I'm just confused about that. It might be speaking more about like the current specifically, that the current of like American progress is, there, there's strong currents wanting American society to regress um, mm -hmm. politically or like socially okay. in particular, those are the most obvious themes. So maybe it's saying like, as a nation, or not even socially, like even from like an industrial standpoint, as a nation, like. We continue to push on. We continue to invent, to reform. So, to, to sort of uh, to hold ourselves from being drawn back into a worse time, the past. Yeah, and throughout the book, uh, one of the themes is that Gatsby is being held back by his past, and by he does his best to escape it, but it's always there. The James Gats is always there, no matter how hard he tries to escape. And I think that's part of what this last time is saying is that no matter how hard you try, you can't escape your past, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't try. And that doesn't mean you shouldn't strive for a better future. Any last thoughts? You feel like you've said your piece, you've done it? Nothing else, no more questions? That's not say one more thing. Okay. I really feel like back to what Thomas said a couple days ago today, that this book represents not only a deconstruction of the American dream and a representation of it. And especially with this last paragraph, it, sh it, g it gives us a sense of hope. Like there, there's a sense of hope in there. Despite all the setbacks and despite all his criticisms of the American dream in the book, there is still hope for the American people. It's actually a good question is, is this book overall a critique of the American dream, or is it in support of the American dream, or a bit of both? Um, perhaps it's, it's, uh, it is a bit of both in the sense that um, it, it's obviously like encouraging you know, some hope in that dreams should not be forgotten, but even though like, they shouldn't be followed to the extent that Gatsby following them, so I think it's, it's more of a, a caution, like proceed with caution um, type of narrative. Yeah, I agree with Callie, I think that's highlighted in um, the part of the quote under number seven where it says, um, his dream must have seemed so close to him that he could hardly fail to grasp it, he did not know that it was already behind him. So basically saying like his whole life was encapsulated in one dream, um, and if you but it's like critiquing it by saying if you get too caught up in one dream, like your life will fly by without achieving it. Oh my gosh. Okay. Yeah, we can stop there. Anything else? Just want to double check. Okay. Yeah. So it's two p.m. Um, that's perfect. So both groups got a chance to speak for about ten or so minutes. I'm gonna let you guys keep this sheet. Um, we'll kind of debrief tomorrow, I think. And this is actually.
to be a passage that I'm going to give you to write your rhetorical analysis essay on. So if you found this discussion, one of them, one of them, like one of four, yeah, one of the four passages. So if you found this discussion to be more enlightening and you feel like you could write an essay about this, then great. So hold on to this for now and then I'll put it Thank you so much. Yeah, we're going to